Okay, welcome everyone to a uh, case study breakdown of a TCA overdose. I have uh, Dave Klein with the current ECG with me here, and we are basically going to be breaking down a TCA overdose with the kind of the ECG that's going on in there and, and why we're seeing such these unique characteristics. And so if you guys haven't heard me before, my name is Jeff Murphy with Master Your Medics, and uh, Dave and I have, uh, have partnered up here in order to do a, a, a case and an interesting case that kind of like ties with our expertise and kind of uh, showing kind of what we can do here. So I'm pretty excited to get this together. It almost didn't happen with all this crazy enough stuff that's uh, that's been going on these <laughs> these last few uh, few weeks with um, the uh, coronavirus. I wasn't even going to mention it, but I'm going to mention it just for fun. Uh, but that is, uh, yeah, so it's been, it's, an, it's been an exciting ride trying to get this all worked out. So I'm excited we finally can get on the air and actually chat about this one. Great. Yeah. Hey, Jeff. Um, thanks again. Really appreciate it. I'm super excited. I don't have a ton of a voice here, but, um, <laughs> but I'm still committed. I'm still committed to, through the laryngitis. Um, I want to give a big shout out to your members, Master Your Medics members. Super, super cool. I want to give a shout out to my current ECG nation. Uh, welcome aboard. I'm really excited to be uh, working on this episode with Jeff. I think it's super cool. It's an interesting topic and sometimes it's sort of glossed over a little bit, but I think we can get into some really cool um, ECG characteristics here and some of the um, you know, treatment options and how we should be thinking when we're approaching these types of patients. Definitely. It, it's, it is a unique patient. I don't think there's any doubt about that. And so it's, it's good to know the, the treatment path we're going to go. I mean, as far as overdoses, this is kind of like the Super Bowl of overdoses of what we're going to do here. There's just so much to be thinking about. And hopefully we can break it down in a way that is understandable and direct. So that way paramedics and paramedic students can go, okay, this is my goal. This is how I'm going to be able to correct it when I identify it. So this is going to be good. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, exactly. Cool, cool. Okay, so let's uh, let's get rolling then. Let's start out with the case here. I'll set the scene for you. So um, you uh, you and your partner, you are um, you're arrive at a residence uh, for a 46-year-old female patient. You got it as an altered mental status. Uh, you're met at the door by a family member. The family member looks distraught. They look concerned. They lead you into the living room where you find your patient laying on the floor. The patient appears confused. They have an altered level of consciousness. They're a little bit mildly combative. So you're concerned. You're running through, what could this be? What are my differentials here? And um, while your partner is able to get some vital signs for you, uh, you, you turn to the family member and you're asking a couple quick questions. You're, you're asking about their, you know, their presentation, their past medical history, and what do you think is going on? So the, uh, the family member uh, indicates to you that uh, this patient has a history of depression, they have anxiety, and they also suffer from hypertension or high blood pressure. They also uh, note that the uh, patient has been you know, increasingly more depressed over the last few weeks, and over the last three days has decided to really self-medicate by increasing their dose of their medication in the hopes that they might try and feel a bit better, but it's just not working. So the family member um, uh, hands you this pill bottle uh, that the, the patient has uh, been taking these pills and says, here's what I think she's been taking, and the pill bottle says amitriptyline on it. Uh, you note that the, the, the medication prescription was filled only uh, four or five days previously, and the bottle's almost empty. So right there, everybody, you have this immediate reaction in your mind that, hey, this may be a, chan a sodium channel blocker overdose because it's a tricyclic antidepressant we're dealing with, with amitriptyline, also known as Elavil. So, of course, your partner goes back with some vital signs. Uh, you note that the blood pressure is 60 on 35. The heart rate is 136 beats per minute. The, uh, the respiratory rate is 26. The SATs are 96% on room air. The blood glucose is seven millimoles. And the temperature of your patient is 37.5. So there you've got your vital signs. And you're considering those vitals. You know the patient now is an unstable patient. And so that sort of heightens our level of, of, of interest and treatment potential for these patients. But of course, one of the things you're definitely going to do, because it's got to be done, is the ECG. And beside the fact that I'm pumped that you're going to do the ECG, you're going to do it. And um, before we jump into some of the really cool characteristics that you can note with a patient who's a uh, uh, tricyclic antidepressant overdose on an ECG, again, I want to highlight the fact that this is a sodium channel blocking problem and that there's many other types of medications that are considered sodium channel blocking agents. And so these ECG changes and patient presentation that you're, you're going to be uh, learning about um, can present themselves in a whole host of different patients, depending on what type of potential sodium channel problem they have. Great. So that's um, 
a good case. And so that way, one thing that I want to mention and something that Dave already mentioned is that there's a, a wide variety of drugs that actually cause sodium channel blockade. And so when it comes to the uh, the actual identifying that it's a TC overdose, the best thing you can do in this particular case, great assessment, good investigation, find pill bottles, find some suggestions and increase the likelihood that this is a TC overdose. But really the key thing to understand here is that we are looking for signs of a sodium channel blockade, which TCAs fall under that that typical presentation. And so we just needed to do a really good assessment, really good investigation, if we're looking to identify it as truly a TCA overdose, um, which can again lead us to down the line of, okay, we have a sodium channel blockade that we need to be looking out for here. Perfect. So I'm just gonna flip the screen here to our pathophysiology with TCA overdose. Did you wanna just quickly touch on kind of the, the concern here of a sodium channel blockade? Okay, so yeah, let's let's get into some of the pathophysiology here. So before again, before we jump into the really cool ECG characteristics that you can use to really identify, you know, patients you think are suffering from a sodium channel blockade, you really have to get an understanding at the cellular level of what's going on there and how are the sodium channels being affected. So in a normal healthy uh, situation, when your cell is at rest, the resting membrane potential of a cell is negative 90 millivolts. Now, when the cell is at rest, it's just sitting there and it's waiting for an action potential and waiting for things to happen. And when things start to happen, a contraction takes place in the cardiomyocyte of your heart. So when the action potential arrives at the cell in a normal healthy cell, what happens is, is that stimulates the vast number of sodium channels to open. And sodium is the most common uh, extracellular positively charged ion. And so there's tons of sodium sitting outside the cell. And so when those uh, sodium channels open, when that action potential arrives, those sodium channels slam open and tons and tons of sodium rushes in in an absolute millisecond. And I mean a millisecond. Tons of it rushes into the cell and your cell goes immediately from negative 90 millivolts at rest to instantly plus 30 millivolts and that stimulates an action potential and a contraction of the cell itself. And so that's what's happening in this normal healthy situation. But when you got a patient who's suffering uh, from a sodium channel blocker overdose, like we do with our patient here, what happens is, is those sodium channels become poisoned. And the, the agent itself, that's, for example, the tricyclic antidepressant, what happens is, is it's binding with those sodium channels at the cellular level. And when the action potential arrives, there's not as many of them left to open. And so things start to slow down. The cell, it still depolarizes, but it's depolarizing at a much, much slower rate. And so things are taking longer to happen. And that's one of the key characteristics of what's happening in a sodium channel blocker overdose, thus the name sodium channel blocker. You don't want to block those sodium channels because we need those. We need those for depolarization to really occur. Jeff, would you like to add anything there? Good. And so just to put a little extra context to it, just so you can kind of get a visual idea of kind of what Dave's talking about here is that if this is your active potential graph, kind of looks like that. And then you have your uh, depolarization here on this, and then you have your calcium that's kind of managing your plateau. And then you have your potassium that is essentially creating the repolarization or start of repolarization here on this end. So we're worried about the sodium channel blockade, which is right here. Okay, on the actual, the first part or the depolarization of this cell. And so what's happening with that sodium channel blockade is that we're still having some sodium that's going to get inside the cell, but we have these pumps or these channels that are going to be essentially blocked. And if we don't have enough of these, then sodium is going to have a slower time getting across. So we still have some that are good. If we didn't have any, then we wouldn't have any oxygen potential whatsoever, which means we wouldn't have any heart rate or any pressure or anything like that, or any living kind of thought process really. But what I'm trying to get at here and what Dave's getting at here is that when we have a decrease in these channels, that means we have a slower time getting sodium from outside the cell to inside the cell to create depolarization. And that's where a lot of our signs and symptoms come from. It's a lot of our ECG changes come from, this slowing of sodium getting inside the cell and creating action potential. Absolutely. So I'll try and I'll zoom into these guys. These are the signs and symptoms I've already written out here for you guys here. So the biggest signs and symptoms that we're going to see with TC overdose uh, that we're going to be concerned about, the decreased respiratory rate, decreased mentation, a lot of them can be agitated and frustrated. That could be more the mentality of the fact that they are attempting an overdose uh, or it could be accidental like we saw in this 
particular uh, situation where it was they're trying to uh, over medicate in order to create or fix their problem that's something that uh, you could see with the TC overdose again they have a decreased G GCS often and so that could create some agitation there as well these signs and symptoms is decreased respiratory acidosis this sodium channel blockade is all going to create a mixed acidosis within the body eventually which is going to be a big big problem down the road and then we have the YQS, the winding QT, and a right axis deviation. And another piece that we're going to talk about in uh, the ECG as well, or Dave's going to mention here in the ECG shortly. And there is a likelihood of seizures as well. And the wider that ECG gets, the more likely seizures are going to occur. So something to take into consideration there as well. Do you want to add anything with that? Uh, no, no, that that's great information. Um, again, just just to really highlight too that uh, you know we, we're going to get to some of the um, the ECG changes here, but it's important to understand that that what Jeff is saying is correct. That phase zero of that sort of graph represents you know depolarization and that that massive influx of sodium into the cell, and that's a, that's an important important mo important moment. Um, the the other thing to consider too is because the ECG changes that occur are quite stunning and so important for us to be able to identify, we know that performing an ECG on this type of patient early is essential to help guide early aggressive treatment of this type of patient who's suffering from a, you know, a life-threatening uh, acidosis and really susceptible to some major dysrhythmias here. So I think, I think getting that ECG and obtaining it as early as possible is going to be really, really key. Yeah, now, even, yeah even 10 milligrams per kilogram over that is considered life-threatening. So Ab absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, anything between 5 and 10 milligrams per kilogram can be lethal. So I 100% I, I agree. So if you're up for it, Jeff, do you want to get to the ECG portion? And yeah, let's pull it. I'll, uh, I'll go through some of the, some of the kind of cool characteristics that you guys can learn to identify correctly with a TCA overdose, or really let's just call it a sodium channel blocking agent overdose. So one of the things to consider and remember here is that this is causing, um, you know, widespread sodium channel blockade. Um, it's causing it in the heart. It's also causing it in the brain, which is what's, what's responsible for some of the seizure activity that you're seeing in these patients. And so remember that sodium channel blocker overdoses are a primary cellular problem. It's at the cellular level. It's the same sort of thing as hyperkalemia. We won't get into that today, although I love talking about hyper-K, but it's a primary cellular problem. And so because it's a primary cellular problem, you start to see changes that affect all areas of the complex, the P wave, the QRS, the T wave. And that's why, first of all, in a TCA overdose, you might see things like PR interval prolongation as, a, as an example. But really to get down to the really stunning findings, what you can expect to see, first of all, is a widened QRS complex. Now, the normal QRS complexes should be between 0 0.08 and 0 0.12 of a second, or 80, milli, 80 to 120 milliseconds as an example. So basically, the normal QRS complex should be three little boxes or less, wide. But when it gets beyond 1.0, so if the QRS complex is greater than 1.0 or 100 milliseconds, you start to enter into the realm of danger here. And so you have about a 10 or 15% chance if your QRS complex gets to be 100 milliseconds wide, you start to get a, a high probability, a 10 to 15% chance that you're going to start to see seizure activity. So the patients may present with seizure-like activity, and that's with a QRS complex of greater than 100 milliseconds wide. And if you look here on these ECG traces, you can see just how wide they are. I mean, you don't really even need a set of calipers here um, to measure it. You can eye it up and really know that it's wide just by looking at it with some practice. Although yeah. I encourage you to measure your QRS complexes, and the monitor will also provide you with fairly accurate readings of what the width of the QRS complex is. So, now when the QRS complex starts to get really wide, now I'm talking greater than 160 milliseconds wide, that is when you start to enter the world of cardiotoxicity. This is when your patient is highly likely to go into a dysrhythmia, 
of a VTAC or a ventricular fibrillation. When you have a QRS complex of greater than 160 milliseconds, you have a 50% chance of suffering from ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. And so for us, that's a big deal because we need to be able to understand that for our patients so we can prepare um, for these potential things to happen in our patients and try and get ready to treat them if we can. So the widening of the QRS complex in a sodium channel blocker overdose is very, very important. So understanding that if, if the QRS complex is greater than 100 milliseconds wide, that's getting too wide. And that these overdoses, they happen very quickly. They happen acutely. So get to understand the, the width of your QRS complex. That's the first thing that you'll see that's quite stunning on the ECG. Yeah. Now, anything to add there, Jeff? Yeah, I did a quick little calculation. So this one's about between 4.25 and 4.5 boxes. This particular, uh, I just did on V2 here, just so we have room for over here when we do axis deviation. Great, uh, great. But um, yeah, so we're, we're over 160 mil equivalents or a million milliseconds right there. So uh, Right. Uh, and so, yeah, we're, we're, le we're going into cardiac toxicity here with this guy. Absolutely. Yep, yeah, absolutely. And thanks for drawing that. That is perfect visual of that. The, the next ECG change that you might see, well, you should see, um, is you, you'll see a positively deflected and wide R wave in lead AVR. That good old forgotten lead, lead AVR. People have heard me rant about this before, you know, often consider the forgotten lead, but in a sodium channel blockade, lead AVR will often have a positively deflected R wave and a greater than three millimeter wide um, width. And you can see here in this lead AVR, it's quite wide. It's greater than three millimeters wide. And that is a characteristic finding. Now, why is that happening? I'll get into why that's happening in just a second. But that leads us to our next ECG finding, which sort of correlates together. And that is the world of axis deviation. Now, in a normal healthy situation, you should have a positively deflected QRS complex in lead one and a positively deflected QRS complex in lead AVF. That would be a normal, healthy situation. But here you see what we have is a negatively deflected complex in lead one and a positively deflected complex in lead AVF. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is known as right axis deviation. So why is the patient suffering from right axis deviation? That's the interesting thing. But it's really a really cool reason. Well, it's not cool for the patient, <laughs> but it is a really cool reason. So you're, um, when, when the patient is suffering from sodium channel toxicity, one of the things that become very susceptible early with respect to the heart's electrical conduction system is your right bundle branch. So just, just as a recap, in normal depolarization, the SA node fires, travels down the internodal pathways to your AV node, there's a pause at the AV node, the signal is then, which allows the atria to contract, the signal then gets released down the bundle of hiss, down the bundle branches, and spreads throughout the Purkinje fiber network, and you have contraction of the ventricles. That's in the normal healthy situation. But in a sodium channel blockade, the right bundle branch for some reason, just the right one, the right bundle branch is really sensitive to this toxicity and it starts to lose its ability to conduct. Conduction through the right bundle branch starts to slow and slows so significantly that what happens is, is that a, a signal comes from your SA node, travels down the internal pathways to the AV node, gets held up at the AV nodes and zing, goes down your left bundle branch normally but slows so significantly down the right bundle branch that what happens is your right ventricle contracts completely separately behind the left ventricle. And because that the right ventricle is now contracting behind the left ventricle, it's, it's creating its own vector or force where normally you don't see that force. Normally when you see a QRS complex on an ECG, you see the left ventricle contracting because it's a big thick muscle. But when the right ventricle contracts separately, in this case, behind the left ventricle, it creates such a force on its own contracting that it causes the axis to shift to the right, where the right ventricle is. And that is why you have right axis deviation. Now, to, just to get back to lead AVR, why does lead AVR have that positively deflected and widen R wave? Well, that's because lead AVR is one of the best leads for looking at the right ventricle. The, the, the three best leads for looking at your right ventricle are lead three, 
Lead One, and Lead AVR. They all have a great view of the right ventricle. And so when you have this right ventricular contraction that's occurring late because of the right bundle branch being slowed up, what happens is it's Lead AVR because it's looking at the right ventricle. It sees the depolarization happening late and gives you this positive deflection and this widened R wave. And that's why you see those key ECG characteristics in this sodium channel blockade. Jeff, anything to add there? No, I think if I added anything, I'd be just <clears throat> regurgitating what you've already said, which is perfect, because these Good. are three very perfect characteristics of what we're going to see with this uh, with the sodium channel blockade. We're going to see the widening QRS, we're going to see the positive deflections in EVR, and we're going to see the right axis deviation. And if you guys are struggling with axis deviation, we just recently did a video on axis deviation talking about using lead one and ABF. Um, for the uh, for the axis deviation. Good, good, yeah. A lot of people forget about how axis deviation works, Jeff. I think it's I think it's a great thing that you've done that. Then that's a fantastic bit of information. People need to understand that axis deviation can really help us understand what's going on with what's happening in the patient's heart. Perfect. So, yeah. so, so that's that's really the key ECG findings and characteristics that you would want to be noting early in a patient you think is suffering from a sodium channel blockade like a medication, like a tricyclic antidepressant, like amitriptyline. Um, maybe we should jump into now. We've recognized the TCA overdose. We've got the ECG characteristics early. So let's maybe hop into what are we going to do for these patients? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, cool. Yeah, so let's go get into the TCA treatment goals. And kind of Dave and I have this philosophy that we don't really talk about the, the kind of the cookie cutter of the algorithm, stuff like that. We want to talk about what the treatment goals are so you guys can use your critical thinking of how to correct or achieve those goals. And so I was pretty happy to hear that that was kind of his mindset because that's always been my mindset. So that way you guys can really train your brains to be thinking about, okay, how do we correct this as opposed to what's next in the algorithm, okay? So the biggest thing that we have here that's going to create this sodium channel blockade, what it's going to do is going to create a, first off, an acidosis, which I think is something that we need to mention as well. So we're going to have an acidosis. Okay, and so remember, we have a decrease in mentation, we have a decrease in respiratory rate, which means that we're going to have a respiratory acidosis, okay, because we're going to have a retention of CO2, which means it's going to increase our CO2. So we're going to have a respiratory acidosis, but we're also going to have, because of the sodium channel blockade and the decreases of the ability to create or have action potential, we're also going to have a uh, metabolic. Okay. And that is going to create, again, a, in turn, mixed acidosis. Mm. Okay, so that's the first thing that I wanted to mention as far as what's going to happen within the body. And now, another interesting thing about TCAs, the more acidotic that patient gets, the more TCAs bind to the receptors to block more sodium channels. So the idea is that we actually want to create or try and create as much of an alkalytic environment as we can. So that way free TCA cannot bind and block more sodium channels. And so that's a big goal is that we want to correct this acidosis that's coming on. Do you have the, uh, the next one that we want to talk about? Yeah, what we want to do is fix, try, try and get on top of this acidosis. Yeah. And so what we're going to be looking to do is give this patient as early as possible the medication called sodium bicarbonate. Now, sodium bicarbonate is a life-saving medication in this particular type of patient. We can give sodium bicarbonate for other types of patients, but in this particular one, it does a couple of really cool things. So for one, sodium bicarbonate, the sodium portion, of, the, of that medication, it competitively um, competes, <laughs> competitively competes. It mm. competes with the TCA itself to bind to the sodium channel receptor. So the, the sodium component of the sodium bicarbonate, it wants to bind to those sodium channels and it's competing with that TCA to do it. And so the, any sodium channels that are still remaining that are not bound by the TCA, the sodium tries to grab a hold of them and, and, and hold them tight so that the TCA can't bind with them anymore. So it's helping to reverse some of the effects of the slowing of conduction through the cell by having the sodium competing with the tricyclic antidepressant agent or the sodium channel blocking agent to bind with that sodium, uh, sodium channel at that particular site. That, that's part one. 
the next thing sodium bicarbonate wants to do is the bicarb bit. And the bicarb bit is trying to change the environment from an acidotic one to an alkalytic one. And as Jeff has, has mentioned, which is really, really important, I'm glad he said it, is that when you change that environment from an acidosis to an alkalosis, what happens is, is that the sodium channel blocking agent, it loses its affinity for binding with the sodium channel. It just loses interest. Think of it that way. It's like, you know what? I'm not interested in binding with the sodium channel anymore. I'm not doing it. In an alkalytic environment, the party is over and the sodium channel blocking agent loses its need or want or affinity, we say, for binding with the sodium channel itself. And then we hope that we have things in our bodies like large proteins that can helpfully bind with some of these freely floating sodium channel blockade agents and we can eliminate them slowly through our body. And so that's how we're helping to correct and reverse the, the overdose and acidosis with this great medication we carry, which is sodium bicarbonate. And the dosing of it um, can vary depending on what jurisdic jurisdiction you work for. For me, it's uh, 100 or a 1 milli equivalent per kilogram to a maximum of 50 milli equivalents. And I can give a, and that's as a bolus. And then I can give a second one uh, or I can give additional boluses, Q10 minutes, but the dose drops down to 0 0.5 milli equivalents. But again, check your local standards and, and what, what your, your, your guidelines refer to with respect to the dosing of sodium bicarbonate. Anything to add there, Jeff? Yeah, really with the sodium bicarbonate, it's getting a lot of flack right now uh, with being a drug that's not really correcting a whole lot of issues. Uh, but I don't think it's going away anytime soon because it is perfect for this particular situation. And the when it comes to how often we're going to be redosing or how much we're going to be giving, there's protocols out there saying that you're going to be queuing that dose, that repeat dose every two minutes. And so there we're seeing very, very high doses and repeat doses of sodium bicarb in order to correct this toxicity that's occurring. Um, and, um, and that's a great thing. Now, one thing that we should mention is that no matter how much you bind that free hydrogen with sodium bicarbonate, what it's going to do is it's still going to shift a carbonic acid and it's going to shift into and split into water and CO2. And so that brings us to the second piece that we need to talk about, which is the respirations. Because again, we have a mixed acidosis due to decrease in respirations and, and minute volume. Now, when it comes to respirations, the, this is a really key thing because not only is it going to help with the acidosis, but it's also going to make sure that this free hydrogen that we're binding on the metabolic side isn't going to just go back to CO2 and then go back to splitting into hydro, free hydrogen and more bicarb. Because that's what will happen if we don't correct this problem is that we're just simply going to be shifting. We're going to bind that hydrogen with sodium and then we're going to put it into a carbonic acid make it a weak acid and then split it in co2 and water that way it can be respirated out however if we don't have this part figured out this respiration side figured out it doesn't stay as co2 and water it shifts back to the metabolic side thus in increasing our acidosis and so we need to make sure we correct this problem as well as early as we can after we start using this sodium blockade. So when it comes to respirations, intubation is probably gonna be in your future with this particular patient. Um, I would say that ketamine is probably a better choice if you're going to go that route uh, in this particular situation just because you have a severely decreased pressure. So even fentanyl uh, could really cause a problem here. And then your, um, any of your benzos in this particular case could be really, really dangerous. Unfortunately, we don't have a choice if we end up seeing seizures, which is a high likelihood with this particular yeah. situation, uh, which is where the fluid and a presser might come in handy with this particular patient. But that being said, I'd say ketamine is probably your best induction agent in this particular situation. And then we're going to target a lower than normal CO2. So most protocols will say on the low end of normal, so 35. Some protocols will say even as low as 30 and never going below 30 kind of idea in order to correct this mixed acidosis and try and make an alkalytic environment or as much of an alkalytic environment as possible. So that way TCO, TCAs can't continue to bind to that sodium channel. Fantastic. That, that's a great point. Um, I, and I, I think you've hit the nail on the head there. Um, you know, the mentioning of intubation is important. I mean, I mean it's not a hundred percent chance you're going to intubate them, but you might have a strong likelihood you might um, just because you understand the physiology and you know what you need to try and help this patient do, which is breathe out. We want to help this patient exhale.
yeah. and get rid of some of that CO2. You also mentioned Jeff, which is really important. The, um, uh, as, as a, uh, as a component of this is the fluid yeah. is that these patients might be hypotensive. We want to help with that blood pressure maintenance, but we also want to help to, you know, move that TCA out of their body by increasing the fluid consumption and, and sort of diluting what we can to, to help them get rid of it, to help overcome this, this overdose and blockade. Yeah. Cause it basically what we can do with fluid. I mean, at, there's protocols that are saying we're going to get a lot of fluid. There's other studies that are saying that uh, limiting the fluid is important as well. Uh, but the big thing is that we're targeting a map of 65, but there is a theory out there saying that if we increase the amount of fluid, we have a larger than normal fluid increase and more input than output. Um, then we could actually stimulate the kidneys to start to uh, excrete and, and actually start to metabolically break down this TCA um, and also maintain that map. Uh, fluids are kind of creating more of a more of a problem within the situation uh, or within within medicine right now uh, because of the acidic environment that you have here. I'd say that ringers is probably, uh, or Hartman's depending on where you are in the world listening to this is a better choice because it doesn't create a, um, an acidic environment as soon as you start to increase more and more fluids. Uh, but if you have the option of so only uh, normal saline then, and you don't have an ability to give a presser, then uh, that's going to be something again, maintaining that map to, uh, to, around 65 in order to make sure that we aren't, um, we aren't losing vital function with this patient. Great. Yeah, totally agree. hundred percent. So that's basically what we're doing here. I'll just kind of re-verbalize kind of what I just said is that, and what Dave said as well is that first off, we're going to be hitting off the, we have a mixed acidosis. So we have two problems that we need to correct in order to keep this patient from getting any more cardiac toxicity. And that's first off, identifying the TCA or the sodium blockade and introducing sodium bicarb, which is going to, again, bind to the sodium channel and also bind to free hydrogen. But remember, if we're binding to free hydrogen, we need to make sure that we're hitting the second part, which is the respirations. Now, you can do this with uh, dropping an SGA in there as well. You don't have to go the intubation route. You can use an SGA. It might be a better option, so that way you can get in there earlier, and that way you're not as worried about this apneic moment as well as a, a, a impending drop in blood pressure regardless of what you do with this intubation an sga might be a better option with this patient and but what we need to be doing is we need to be controlling those respirations and so we uh, we want to try and target a lower uh, so 35 end tidal CO2, or even in some cases a 30 in order to, again, create as much of an alkalytic environment as we can and blow off as much of that CO2 as we possibly can that we're going to, again, create more when we start bonding to that free hydrogen. And the last thing is that we talked about was the potentiation of seizures, which the wider and wider that ECG gets, the more and more likely seizures are going to occur. And so our treatment for seizures in this particular case is still going to be a benzo. It's the only thing that really we have in the repertoire that's going to stop it, but it needs to happen because the more seizures we have, the more acidotic this environment's going to get. I totally agree. And the seizure thing, just to quickly mention again, um, they can happen quite early, you know, in the beginning of the toxicity. Uh, sodium channel blocking agents are considered lipophilic, which is um, important to understand because that means they can cross the blood brain barrier and target those neuronal cells right away. Mm -hmm. So the, the seizure activity is not an uncommon finding. And so what you're saying, Jeff, is preparing for those types of seizure activity is important. Yeah, definitely. And, uh, you, uh, we definitely have an environment that we need to be worried about, especially with that low BP. And so fluids as well as a presser might be in the future as well, because we, we're, we're really looking at a situation where if we, if we, give, a, um, if we give a seizure medication like, uh, like Versed, where we know that we're going to have a drop in BP, it might be quite dangerous for this patient. But I mean, you, you're, you're kind of playing on the two sides of evil on this one, but we need to stop that seizure or things are just going to get worse. I absolutely agree. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that's a, a good place to kind of summarize what we've talked about here. Is there anything else you wanted to bring up with the, well, uh, the treatment? Uh, no, I think you summarized that well. All right. Just to, uh, you know, we're going to get into the end of this sort of cool episode, but I want to summarize some of the ECG changes for everyone out there. Um, so again, first things you're probably going to be looking for and, and, and seeing quite notably is a widened QRS complex. And so if your QRS complex is greater than 100 milliseconds, you start looking out for that seizure activity. You start worrying about dysrhythmias, and if the, the QRS continues to widen, once you reach the ranges of 160 milliseconds, 
you are cardiotoxic and you should start to consider that this patient may have ventricular runs or VTAC or VF. And so watch the widening of the QRS. Next, you're looking for that positive R wave in lead AVR and you want it to be wide, at least three millimeters wide in lead AVR. Remember, because lead AVR is looking at that right ventricle and it's seeing the changes that are happening because the axis is shifting to the right. And why is it shifting to the right? Because that right bundle branch is allowing the right ventricle to contract separately, basically, behind when the left contracts and you're getting the right axis deviation. So widen QRS, positive R wave and lead AVR and it's wide and a right axis deviation are some of the key ECG characteristics of a sodium channel blockade. Well, thanks again for... For joining us here, Dave, uh, it's been awesome having you, having an expert in ECGs and be able to talk about it in this, this level. I think this is a great little um, piece where you, you really kind of highlighted the three main points here that, that need to be talked about in TCA. So thanks again for coming on and, and chatting with us about and giving your expertise in the ECG realm. And um, it was a great, this is a perfect case for us to kind of collaborate on just because we could really talk about those two big pieces, which is the metabolic and far, or the... Um, the pathophysiology and then the ECG and identifying that is really key in going into those treatments that we're talking about. So this is awesome. Yeah, it was great. We're a good team. Uh, it was a good, it was a good, uh, good episode. Hope we get to do it again. I, I had a lot of fun. Honestly, Jeff, that was excellent. And uh, I'll just end my bit here on how I always end all my little episodes on my current ECG. So you get ready for my little, my little tag here, Jeff. All right. All right. Until next time, sugar water auction to survive. The eyes can't see what the mind doesn't know. And in Klein's world, who gets an ECG? Almost everybody. Stay current.